Thank you, team, for that great singing. Welcome, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, it's hard to believe it's our last Sunday before Christmas. Um, I don't know. The years seem to go by so fast. Let's open prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you uh, anytime, anywhere, and we just help us to be mindful of that even more over this Christmas season. Um, just be mindful of you and others in their needs, and we just uh, praise you for all you do for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Um, there's lots of good singing planned for today, and uh, I'll just uh, maybe announce some of the things coming up on your bulletin. Any questions? There's, uh, of course, there's our concert tonight. We're hoping everybody can make it. And supper's at 5.30 and concert to follow. So. And uh, December 24th, I think Marty's a big part of that, getting uh, the, uh, that going. And that's at 7.30 as well. Yep. Anything else we're missing that should be on the bulletin? No? We're good. Okay. 
We'll just uh, maybe go to prayer or praise items at this time as well. And I think, uh, I don't know if it was Pat or somebody, or Marty sent that about uh, that, that number one. It's, yeah, the Quebec government uh, has mandated that. And yeah, definitely, yeah, something to be in prayer about. And just, of course, the costly family, the pass, passing of Lee's and, and Alan White as well. Yeah, lots of people who will be traveling. The Rhymers are one I can think of. They could probably go in the furthest. So, yeah, just pray, pray, for, pray for safety and uh, good travel. Anything else you ask, want prayer for? Good. Let's just go to prayer once again. Lord, we thank you. And... Uh, we just especially pray for those who have lost uh, loved ones at this time. Um, we just think of the costly family. Just pray for Ivan and that entire family. It's just, uh, it, it is comforting to know that Lee's knows you and she's with you now, Lord. And uh, that is such a, uh, a good feeling to, to have. And so we just pray for each and every one of their family and help us to, to help in any way we can. And uh, just be mindful of their needs. And for Alan White and his family, Lord, too, we just uh, pray for them with the, the passing of Al. Um, and same with that. Help us to, to be there and uh, whenever we can. And there's so many things we... We take for granted, Lord, and it's safe travels. And uh, we just pray for each and every one who is uh, traveling to uh, family and friends this this holiday, and just watch over them, give them safety, and uh, and uh, just a great time. And uh, we just uh, help us to s stay focused on the real meaning of Christmas, Lord, and the birth birth of your baby, our Savior. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. So I. Uh, We'll get right. Do we have singing? Oh, there we go. We got more than singing. Brad's warming up here, so.
six. Please be seated. seated. <laughs> and uh, before I call Pastor Marty up to give the message, I'll ask Derek and Allie to come forward and light the Advent candle. lighten the angel candle when we think of angels the conventional image of white robed figures with wings and halos may come to mind but the term angels as used in scripture has more to do with the vocation than appearance the New Testament word angels simply means messenger and so today our focus is more on the significance of the message than of the carrier. I don't know. Mary the angel said, Don't be frightened, for God has decided to bless you. To Joseph, the angel's message was, Don't be afraid to go ahead with your marriage to Mary, for the child within her has been conceived by the Holy Spirit. To the shepherds outside of Bethlehem, the angels announced, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news to great joy for everyone the savior yes the messiah the lord has been born tonight but what about today in a world terrorized by evil uncertainty and pain if the angels were to visit here today what would their message be to us for those who have not yet received jesus as your savior and lord the message would clearly be don't be afraid today is the day of salvation Salvation is found in you, in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. 
And for those who call, call him Lord, we have a message of promise as recorded by John in the book of Revelations. And the angel showed me a pure river with the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing from the throne, throne of God and of the Lamb. No longer will anything be cursed. There will be no night there, no need for lamps or sun, for the Lord God will shine on them, and they will reign forever and ever. O oh Lord, thank you that we don't need to be afraid. You are the hope of salvation. In you we put our trust. Well, good morning. And thank you so much, you two, for lighting the angel's candle. Hey, Allie, you want, you want to hear a story? You, you know how angels light candles with a match made in heaven? Yeah? Just, you tell that to all your friends. It's going to rock. That's awesome. And what about this worship team? That's so wonderful. Man, I was wondering what else you guys were going to pull out there. There's got to be a tuba, maybe a trombone. So wonderful. I, I love uh, and I'm so thankful for the I Sing Worship app that we're able to utilize. But there's just something about uh, instruments and, and uh, our, own, our own voices that just kind of speak a little bit more uh, closely to the heart. All right, I'll switch to this mic there. If you want. If you have your scriptures, you can turn to the Gospel of Luke. And we'll be looking at the same passage we did last week from Luke uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 20. And I'll be reading from um, the New International Version. The Word of the Lord. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first sentence that took place while Quirinus was the governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for them, for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was laying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they spread word concerning what had been told to them about the child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Amen? Amen. And if you want to see a very exciting, dramatic presentation of the scripture that was just read, you need to come this evening and see our Sunday school uh, kids and, and young adults and adults uh, 
perform this uh, for yourselves. So you've been told, now you have to come and just be amazed. And also before that, there will be food. Food is good, yes? Amen. And so we hope that you'll join us for supper. Well, let's now uh, eat of a different kind. As the Lord said, the man does not live on bread alone, but of every worth that proceeds from the mouth of God, and which we have just read. So let us pray. Father, we give thanks to you. We give thanks to you for your word and how you have spoken to us. And Lord, how you desire to speak through us. Oh Lord, we live in a world that is struggling right now. Struggling afar and struggling near. Lord, as our announcements and our, our prayer requests remind us, Lord, that we live in a world that is still um, struggling with brokenness and sin and death. Oh, Father, people's hearts today mourning the loss of wives and mothers and husbands and fathers. Oh, may your spirit draw near to us. But also near to us would be the message of the angels to the shepherds. The good news Good news has come. It has broken into our world through the person of your son, Jesus. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would be glorified today in the reading of your word, in the singing of the songs that we have sung, but most importantly, within our hearts, Lord, that seek to worship you and live lives that are shaped around that worship. I pray for myself now that you'd speak to me and, and through me and all of us, Lord, as we, we dig deeper into your word, uh, knowing that you are the one who brings wisdom and that you give us the power and the grace to be able to do all the things that you have called us to do, all the good things that you have prepared for us in advance, even before we were born. We thank you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we live in tumultuous times. The world trying to figure out what to go on with this pandemic and what have you. And I recently heard of a story of President Joe Biden and, and Vladimir Putin and Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. And they were together and they had a near-death experience. And they entered the, the throne room of, of God and they, they saw the Lord and they saw his, his angels. And the angel said, you men, your time has not come. You will return to earth, but you are allowed to ask God one question. So Biden, the president, says, Lord, I, I want to know, when will this coronavirus pandemic end? So the angels drew near to him. They heard from the Lord, and then they came back to Biden, and they whispered in his ear, not during your term of office. Secondly, Putin, he asked the question, Lord, when will, will communism rise again over capitalism and, and restabilize the world? So the angels took that message to God, and God spoke to them and brought back, and they whispered in Putin's ear, not during your time in office. And then there's Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau says, Lord, when will politicians stop uh, just living for themselves and lining their pockets with the money of the people? So the Lord thought about this. The angels came to him and he gave them the word and the angels came and whispered in Trudeau's ear, not during my time in office. <laughs> You've probably heard that one before. Yeah. That was the only one I could find that talked about angels giving us a message. That was a message of bad news, but the Lord gives us a message of good news. Angels are messengers of God. That um, angels uh, are very prominent uh, within the... the the infancy narratives, Jesus, the beginning chapters of Luke. We see not one, not two, but three angelic visitations. One to Zechariah, one to Mary, then to the shepherds. And they bring news that is good. The angels proclaim the good news of Christ into the world. We find angel, an angel, or at least the word angel anyway, in a word that we use a lot, evangelism. 
To be an evangelist is to be what? To proclaim what? The message, the good news of Christ. I, I love that we see these shepherds hear the message of the angels and they themselves become messengers proclaiming everything that they have heard and seen isn't that what it means to be a witness hmm? if you uh, had spotted something an accident or what have you and you were called to be a witness in court they wouldn't ask you to comment on what somebody else had seen they would ask you to comment on what you've seen and so it is with our testimony, our, our story with God and in God, that we tell of the story how the Lord has come to us and how he has worked in us and through us. You know the amazing thing about that is nobody can argue with that. Why? Because it's your story. I could say to you, Tina and I were talking the other day, and, and we were talking about this, and you could say, no, you didn't. I mean, no, we didn't. Are you nuts? I, I, am a tes I give testimony to what happened. And we discuss these things. And so it is with our testimony before men that we proclaim the work of God within our lives and through our eyes. And so we see these heavenly beings doing the exact same thing. Hebrews 1.14 tells us that, uh, that angels are ministering spirits um, who serve God. We cannot see them, but they labor on our behalf. And in that we can rejoice. But there's something also very clear made in scriptures that we're not meant to be too preoccupied with them. And we're certainly not to pray to them or worship them. In, uh, in Revelation, which uh, Derek uh, just read from, um, in, in chapter 22, when, when John uh, is finished seeing and hearing the, the revelation, the vision given to him, he falls down before the angel which showed him these things, and he begins to almost worship. However, the angel will have none of that. He says, do not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and with your fellow prophets and with all who keep the words of the scroll, worship God. Don't worship me. Worship God. Angels like us are created beings, created to worship the one that has no beginning and no end. And yet, like Gabriel, as he tells Zechariah, he stands in the presence of God. And so Gabriel reflected the glory of God. And the angel's presence within the infancy narratives of the Lord remind us that Christmas is a celebration of God breaking into his own world once again. Many historians, they, they love the Bible. Um, no book rivals it. It's the greatest document that we have in terms of quantity and quality from antiquity. But not all historians like the angels. They're a reminder that the scriptures speak of the supernatural. And because of this, secular historians are, are suspect. They under, can they be trusted? Um, they see myth rather than majesty, and they see bias rather than biography. But all friends, I'll tell you that any history, any historical record has a bias. Um, they mind them for all that they say about Jesus as a person and what he said and the world was like in which he lived. But they'll have none of this angel or men following stars or virgin birth business. You know what's interesting is that we often think that the world in which Jesus came from was different, but it was no different concerning these things. When the angels appeared to the shepherds, what were they? They were terrified. Why? Because these things didn't happen every day. This was different. This was spectacular. This was supernatural. This was wondrous. This was out of the ordinary. And these are men who himself said they believed in such things. 
but when they saw with their own eyes and experienced with their own ears. Is it any wonder, is it any wonder, sorry, pun intended, that of all the three angelic appearances, Luke has the angels repeating the same phrase to Zechariah, Mary, and the shepherds. What is that? Do not be afraid. And you know, you know why the angel said that? Because they were afraid. They were afraid. The wonder, the majesty, the glory. The angel that was present at the tomb of the resurrection of Christ is said to have an appearance as lightning whose clothes were as white as snow. You realize this is human language, right? They're trying to explain, to put into words in which we will understand and comprehend the way that they understood it. And when they looked upon an angel, they said it was like his face was like lightning. His clothes were white as snow. You see, the angels remind us that heaven is near. We have this idea that, that, that heaven is up, right? Somewhere far, far away. Maybe we get that idea because when the Lord ascended, he ascended up. Until they couldn't see him anymore. But yet, I believe that Jesus was making a point that he was once again being raised, elevated to a place at God's right hand. A name which every knee shall confess. I mean, every tongue confess, every knee shall bow. But when, when God spoke to the prophets, when God spoke to his friends, when he spoke to, to Moses, and before that, Abraham, and, and after them, the disciples at the transfiguration of Christ, how did he speak to them? Where did he speak to them? From the space around them. From the air about them. From the atmosphere. The scriptures speak about the heavens in three ways. The heavens is the atmosphere. Uh, the air about us. And then, and then secondly, the heavens. That being the, the celestial uh, uh, world of the stars and the planets. And then there's heaven. The third heaven. The, the dwelling place of God. And yet the scriptures show us that heaven is near. We cannot see it, not with eyes that we have today, but when we look at the presence of Christ, when we look at Jesus coming in the flesh as he did, we see God in Jesus parting the curtain between heaven and earth and Jesus himself stepping forward and revealing to us who he is. And who God is. And let us remember that the end of our story is not us flying away somewhere far, far away in heaven and, and playing the harps and eating the cream cheese and all those kind of stories and what have you. The end of our story is that heaven comes here. That John says, behold, I saw Jerusalem descend and there was a new heaven and a new earth. heaven and earth together a marriage given to us as we are one with Christ God came to us as one of us he made himself approachable the wonder of the incarnation God becoming us taking on flesh came to Philip Yancey while he was taking care tending to his fish has anybody ever had an aquarium fish? Anyone? I remember our friend Brian, when we got some, they said, you know what? You'll get it, and you'll never have them again. And he was right. <laughs> we waited till every single one of them died, and then we threw away the aquarium. <laughs> That's a lot of work, you know, keeping those things alive. 
course, we had one fish. I think it was given to Susan, from Susan to Tina. You gave us a fish, and that fish killed all the other fish. It was like a serial killer fish, and it kept eating all the other fish, right? And only it was left. And so we had to clean the thing. You know, you know it's time to clean when the fish uses its fin to, you know, just make it. So you guys still out there? And so Tina was cleaning it, and the, I guess, you know, since it had no one else to kill, it just didn't have a reason to live. So it jumped out of the fish tank. Tina didn't realize this. She turned around, and she stepped on it. And it was a translucent fish, so when she looked to see what she stepped on, all she saw was two eyeballs <laughs> staring from the back of her, bottom of her feet. But she came to herself. I don't know how she did it, but she got the fish back in the tank. Sadly, it didn't live much longer. Gladly, it didn't live much longer. But anyway, Philip Yancey said, I learned about the incarnation when I kept a saltwater aquarium. Management, or marine aquarium, I discovered, is no easy task. You'd think of you of all the energy expended on their behalf, that my fish would at least be grateful. Not so. Every time my shadow loomed above the tank, they dove for cover into the nearest shell. They showed me one emotion, only fear. To my fish, I was a deity. I was too large for them, my actions too incomprehensible. My acts of mercy they saw as cruelty. My attempts at healing they viewed as destruction. To change their perceptions, I began to see would require a form of incarnation. I would have to become a fish and speak to them in a language they could understand. A human being becoming a fish is nothing compared to God becoming a baby. And yet, according to the Gospels, that is what happened to Bethlehem. The God who created matter took shape within it. As an artist might become a spot on a painting or a playwright, a character within his own play, God wrote a story only using real characters on the pages of real history. The Word became flesh. And then he quotes John 1.14, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory of the one and only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Glory. That's what Zechariah, Mary, the shepherds, they reacted to. Glory. And that was just a reflection of God's glory. I, I hear people talk so flippantly about God. When I stand before him, he will get a piece of my mind. Well, let me tell you, friends, I can tell you one thing. First, you're not going to be standing. And second, you're not going to be saying anything. You're going to be trembling. Because he's God. As the shepherds did. But the message of the messengers was good. Do not be afraid. We bring you good news. And the message is still good news. I love that. Uh, you guys remember Veggie Tales? Are you that old? You remember, you remember the one on Jonah with the fish? And I love it. Jonah is, you know, he's an asparagus, right? And he, he's coming into the, or a pickled bean, I can't remember. I don't know why I said pickled, a bean. And he's coming into the community, and, and everybody's like, is the message good? Is the message good? Is the message good? Because God's message isn't always good. And you can say, well, why, why would that be? Well, because the, the actions, the heart of the people are always good. But I, I love in the movie, and, and Jonah says, it's good news! And everyone rejoices. Turns out, uh, he didn't like the good news. The good news is I want you to go to Nineveh, to your enemies, and proclaim to them the mercy of God. He didn't want that. He wanted God to be merciful to himself and people like him. He didn't want God to be merciful to others, the others. But God is, because God has created all in his image. And the good news of the angels is that now peace and favor. Christ has come for whom? All people. All people. 
Today is the day of salvation. What I love about uh, all of these angelic encounters in, in, in Luke's uh, gospel at the beginning is every single one experiences fear, but in every single case, that fear gives away to praise. Um, Zachariah, praise God, well, once he could speak. If you remember, he got in a little trouble uh, for asking a question when he should have been listening. He couldn't speak for nine months. Oh, it was a wonderful time in Elizabeth's life, right? But once he was able to speak, what happened? Just praise came forth. Luke um, chapter 1, 68 to 69, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has come to his people. He has come to his people and he has redeemed them. He has raised up the horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. How many years was there between Malachi and Matthew? Remember? 400 years. 400 years. Where people were coming to wonder, has he forgotten about us? And you remember in that movie, Grumpy Old Men, you ever saw that? And there was, and there was the grumpiest of the grumpy old men, played by Burgess Meredith. Ah, I loved his character. And, and he was talking to his son, and he was just talking about all these health crazes. And he was just saying, all these people, they get up and they exercise and, and, and they eat right. You know what I have for breakfast? Bacon. You know what I have for lunch? Bacon. You know what I have for supper? A sandwich of bacon. And all those health nuts, they're all pushing daisies. And here I am. And yet he gets all melancholy, and he thinks, I wonder sometimes if God has forgotten about me. God has not forgotten about him. God has not forgotten about Israel. The Apostle Paul tells us in the fullness of time, at just the right time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem us from the law. Just at the right time, the perfect time, Mary praised the Lord too. Luke 1, 46 to 50. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has been mindful and humble at the state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed. For the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to all those who fear him from generation to generation. And as we read, the same is true of the shepherds who praise God and proclaim to all what the angels had said concerning this child, the child that they went, the sign of the sign they were given, a child lying in a manger, wrapped in swaddling clothes, and all the things that he would do and who he was. And they proclaim just as the angels proclaim. What did the angel say to John? We're, we're fellow servants just like you. Luke 2, 13 to 14. Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you praised God? You can say, well, Pastor Marty, we just, we just sang songs of worship together. That's true. But did you worship when you sang them? Because worship songs without worship are just songs. Remember what Isaiah, the Isaiah told Israel, the Lord spoke through Isaiah saying, because this people draw near to me with their mouths and they honor me with their lips while their hearts are far from me. And their fear of me is a commandment taught by men. Their hearts are far from me. Oh, I love that passage of scripture. Just, 
And the Lord, ah, I'm tired of your songs. I'm tired of your festivals. I'm tired of your sacrifices. Don't you realize that every bull on every hill belongs to me? And these are the words that Jesus quoted to his religious contemporaries, the most religious men of his generation. Jesus said, you hypocrites, this is exactly whom Isaiah was speaking, that you honor God with your lips, but your heart is far from him. There's a popular song we sing. It says this, when the music fades, all is stripped away, and I simply come, longing just to bring something that's of worth that'll bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into my heart. And I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing that I've made it, when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. When's the last time we really worshiped? Where we opened our hearts to God, and then we opened our mouths and our lips praising the God of our salvation. No complaining. No requests, just worship and praise for the one that deserves it, for what he has done, what he is doing, and what he will do, and just for who he is. Who am I that you should know my name? If we haven't, if we can't remember the last time we did that, where we worship, well, how do we get there? Well, maybe like we've learned this morning, what we need is a little fear. Do you remember what, uh, what Mary said when she praised God? His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. But wait a second, didn't, didn't Gabriel tell Mary not to be afraid? Yes. He didn't tell her not to fear God. We fear God. We're, we're, we're not talking about being terrified. Ah, that's going to happen because we just we experience God when we see God, when we have that, that, that moment where, where that, that curtain is stripped away and, and we, we try to behold and see God. It's just, we just, there's just this reaction. We fall on our knees. Happened to Isaiah. Happened to John. It's going to happen to you. It's going to happen to me. For every knee shall what? Bow. And every tongue confess that Christ is the Lord. We will see him. We'll go, You're the Lord. You're the Lord. And we think of heaven as so oh, this place where we're going to ride dinosaurs. And, you know, there'll be, there'll be water slides in the crystal sea. And I've had people tell me that the temperature there will be different in my heaven than the temperature in their heaven. And, and all these different things. And I'm like, where did you get that? Don't get me wrong. I like water slides. And it'd be really rocking to ride a T-Rex. But nothing is going to be compared to just being in the presence of Christ. And to praise him. Why? Because that's what we were created to do. And we were created to partner with God. And all the things that we do, all the gifts that he has given us are good and beautiful. All good things are gifts from our Father, the Father of lights. But when we join our talents, our gifts, and they're married to our purpose to praise God and to create as he is created, to partner with him, then we are alive. We're fully alive. And we will praise him. We need to fear the Lord, recognizing who God is. And that fear is reverence. That fear is awe. That fear is recognizing who God truly is and who he is in my life. It comes from meeting with the Lord, opening our hearts and our eyes and our ears 
to who God is and what God is doing and what he's done. You know, Christmas, we can be so busy. We don't stop to look. We don't stop to hear. But it's going to happen. You know that, right? You, you know that a moment like that is coming. If we believe what we really say we believe, just like the shepherds, we're going to be going about our day. We'll be working. We'll be doing whatever. And then all of a sudden, boom, we will hear a trumpet sound. And we will be caught up with the Lord. And in the twinkling of an eye, we will be transformed. That which was perishable is now imperishable. That which is mortal now immortality. And he will wipe away the tears from our eyes and all the former things will be gone. And in a new heaven and under, and under a new heaven and in a, on a new earth, we will praise the Lord God. But this day, it takes the time to be still to know he is God, and then to shape our entire life around him. We need to practice it as Mary practiced it. In Luke chapter 2, 19, but Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. We need to stop in the craziness, the busyness of our lives and our schedules, and we need to take the first invitation, the most important invitation, invitations that we have been declining because we're accepting too many other invitations to come before the Lord and to recognize who He is, to worship Him, to fear Him in awe, and to be blessed because he has brought good news. And may we be the same this Christmas, like the angels. May God's grace and glory be seen in us and heard from our lips. There are men and women today in Moss Bank, just like the shepherds. They're going about their work, not knowing that any second heaven can come knocking. The greatest gift is Christ. Let us worship the Lord our God. We can even practice here together. In a moment, our friends are going to come forward and we're going to sing a song. A song about what? Worship. And may we do what we were made to do. May we focus on the Lord who because of us focused on us and he sent his son to redeem us from our sin and to give us life, life everlasting. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We praise you. Lord, our words, my words are not worthy enough. But Lord, you just require that we would be honest with you, that we would open our hearts to you. And even if our hearts right now are God, are like, I don't want to worship you. Maybe we're angry. Things in this world... Oh, Lord, you are not divorced from these things. You know these things more than ever. But, Lord, you didn't send us a, uh, a backup plan. You sent us yourself. Jesus, you entered the muck and mire of our world. You, you, you faced our pain head on. You allowed yourself to take upon our scars and our brokenness. You faced our death and lived the life that we were meant to live. Oh, Lord Jesus, I pray that we would have your heart and we would have you. And so even in the honesty of our hearts, Lord, that we would say, I'm not prepared to worship, but Lord, make me ready. Give me a heart of worship. Show me yourself. Oh, Father, if we are at a place, we're just recognizing the things that you have done and you're doing and who you are. Lord, we just ask like... Uh, 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 the one gentleman, uh, uh, Jabez, that, that, you, that you would increase our territory, that, that you would make us a greater blessing, that you, that you would open doors uh, of conversation and, and, uh, to people and opportunities to serve and to give and to love and to proclaim yourself first in action and then in word. Oh, Lord, we pray for all these things. 
We thank you now, Lord, that as we sing together, may we not only harmonize our voices together, but may our hearts together be unified in the Holy Spirit and that we be of one mind in Christ Jesus and bring praise to you, our Father. In your name, Lord. Amen. Go in grace and be gracious to one another. Amen.